Hello, I am Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have Ms. Janet Hurley joining us today for this webinar entitled Effective and Efficient School Facilities Maintenance Integrated Pest Management. Ms. Hurley currently serves as an Extension Program Specialist for Texas AgriLife Extension. In addition, she has coordinated the Texas School IPM team and the development of a school IPM cost calculator. For her IPM awareness efforts, Ms. Hurley has received numerous awards for excellence and continues to serve as an expert consultant on IPM. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented, engage with the speaker, and add to your professional knowledge of issues related to effective and efficient school facilities maintenance. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Effective and Efficient School Facilities Integrated Pest Management webinar. I hope that everyone will have questions for us at the end, and again, Please use your checkbox or the text box to send us your questions. Thank you. So let us begin. Let's talk about some basic facts of why you may be interested in either integrated pest management or IPM. As some of you may or may not know, most of our U.S. bodies of water are major sources of, of water and of nutrition. But did you know that 96% of our fish, 100% of our surface water, and 33% of our major aquifers contain one or more pesticides? This impacts us because when these pesticides get into our water stream, we cannot take that out. Um, as you guys may or may not know, most of our children now have an average of 91 chemical contaminants in their body. Part of them are pesticide related, some of them can be carcinogens, neurotoxins, reproductive toxins, or endocrine disruptors. This comes from water and from food sources. Nowadays, we find that most of our children, not just in urban settings, but around the nation, have asthma. Our current statistics are around one in four kids have asthma, which is about 7.1 million students. This exceeds what we have had in many past years, and we are up to about 25% of kids in urban areas. Asthma triggers like cockroaches, dust mites, pesticides can all be triggers. And costs, based on what the Centers of Disease Control have given us, has been about $50 billion per year. That is a lot of money that we spend on asthma treatments. One child who misses a school day can cost up to $300 per worker or $93 per student, depending on where they're at, depending on the treatment. That's a lot of money. $14.4 million in school days lost each year due to asthma alone can impact a lot of school districts nationwide. Well, when people think about integrated pest management, they think, oh, it's just about pest control. Well, yes, as this, these images show you, yes, there's lots of pests, but what you don't understand is those pests do relate back to asthma and allergy triggers, water problems, and environmental problems. So the trick is, how do we balance pests, pesticides, and a safe lear learning environment? Cockroaches and indoor mold can cause asthma. Mites and rats are the most common problems in schools and homes. It's interesting because a lot of news coverage here lately has been over mice and rats in schools, especially in my home area, which is in Dallas. 
Other things that also can contribute to um, indoor allergies and asthma are indoor pollutants such as pesticides, like I said, molds, insect allergens, and, you know, just good old-fashioned dust mites. So what is IPM? Well, it's not just pest control. It's a way about thinking and reacting to everyday actions. And that comes from a school safety perspective. It's more than just roaches, rats, ants, bats, weeds, um, feral cats, feral dogs, you name it. We, there's always a pest. But it's also about maintaining a safe learning environment so that teachers and students can actually do what they need to do. It's about people working together and, and as we'll see, it's mandatory in several states across the nation. So a little history lesson. It seems like 1990 was just around the corner. I know for me it does, but believe it or not, in the early 90s, the US EPA introduced school IPM as a way to help schools get over their heavily reliance on baseboard, baseboard spraying. They gave a lot of grants. They helped a lot of um, land-grant institutions on learning how to do IPM in schools. They funded some regional centers to also help with learning about IPM through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. What that led to was a couple of states early in the 90s adopting school IPM. And they were basically adopted because in these states there were some issues with uh, overuse of pesticide chemicals for everything from cockroaches, but predominantly for head lice. Today, we have close to 39 states that have some type of IPM mandate or pesticide regulations for schools. Back in 1999 and for several years during 2000 to 2010, the federal legislation, the School Environmental Protection Act, was introduced, but it never really made, got off ground through Congress. And briefly, these are tables that show where which states have some of these rules. You can keep on the lookout. Um, hopefully, our National School IPM Steering Committee will be coming out with a journal article that will have information about not just this table, but the second half of the table for all 50 states of what states actually have interior post posting outdoor posting, pre-notification to parents, um, school staff members, an IPM law or rule, re-entry requirements beyond label. What we mean by that is there is either a 4, 8, 12, 24-hour re-entry after pesticide is used, and then also defines what types of products can be used in schools so that we can go for lower impact, lower toxicity type products. So what do pests need to live? Well, pests are like humans. They need food, water, and a harborage to, to thrive in any environment. It doesn't matter if it's a classroom, if it's a school cafeteria, or if it's your home. So the first thing we try to teach when we do IPM is reduce pest populations. Remove at least one. At least remove food, remove water, remove shelter, and hopefully that will help start to eliminate your pest problems. So how is IPM different? I get asked this a lot. Well, why, why would I want to do IPM and not do traditional pest control, which is going in and typically making a pesticide application? Well, the truth is IPM focuses on safe and effective ways to control pests, but it also balances the, the difference between pests and pesticides, but it uses things like thresholds and monitoring before making a pesticide application. It also looks at where that pest is harboring. In other words, if you were treating for ants, you would go to the ant nest and not just deal with the ants in a classroom. These are specific steps that must be followed for every type of pest problem. Integrated pest management is a strategy that we call using multiple control tactics. There is more than one silver bullet. You have to manage pest levels at acceptable levels. The hard part here is what could be acceptable for one person is not acceptable for others. But I will be very honest with you, 
one mouse, one rat is considered an unacceptable level. Cockroaches, well, it, that all depends, but if you have a, the small little cockroaches that live indoors with humans, they're never an acceptable level. But spraying isn't an acceptable level either. We have to remember that sometimes when we make these applications that we also don't want to have risk to people and other non-target organisms. And that we also want to make sure our programs are practical and economical, especially in these economic times. We want to make sure that we're taking care of the environment, but we're also making sure that we're taking care of pest proofing, sanitation, and clutter control. And clutter control is a big thing in schools. So some essential ingredients for your IPM program. Well, the first thing we like to do is have a point person. We call them the IPM coordinator. The second is an IPM policy. The third, and this one is really important, is employee involvement. It cannot just be that IPM coordinator running around a district like a chicken with their head cut off because they'll just never make it. Inspections and monitoring, understanding that you may be doing inspections for your asbestos program or your risk management program. That goes hand in hand with the IPM program. Pest identification, this is extremely important. Knowing what pest you have is knowing how you're going to do the next step, which is managing treatments, understanding the action thresholds and using multiple control tactics. And then finally, education, not just education for the coordinator, the pest management professional, but also education for teachers, custodians, and everybody else that works in the school system. So that IPM coordinator, well, who's this person? Well, he and she is the designated responsible person for overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the PEST program. That means that, you know, they're the go-to person if you've got ants in your classroom. They're the go-to person who's going to make sure that the, all the multiple control tactics are going to be done. They over, oversee maintaining that building. They often wear many, many hats. A lot of times they could be a facilities director. They can be the risk manager. They can be a lot of different people. So yes, sometimes the, things get lost in the shuffle, but this is the ultimate person who can help you with every problem that you have. They also will help you with making sure that if your state has specific rules about pesticide applications and notification, they're the go-to person to know about those things. The IPM policy statement. This is something that the district, and when I mean the district, I mean the school board adopts. It should be somewhat detailed and it gives some direction about how things are going to, to progress within a district with a pest problem. The nice part about this is, is if you're doing a IPM policy, it gives information to the school board, it gives information to the teachers, it also gives information to the parents. It's one of those well-tuned organisms that is used in schools to help keep everybody on track. Some of the things that it can be folded into, again, like I said, is your indoor air quality program. It can be into a risk manager program. It can be an environmental committee. It can be an energy committee because truthfully, IPM looks at all of those aspects. So employee involvement. This one is typically overlooked a lot when we're talking about IPM. We typically think it's that coordinator or it's that pest control guy that comes in and quote unquote sprays once a month, but it's not. This really means IPM is everyone's responsibility. I mean, if every teacher knew that there was a broken door in the building and they reported it to the right proper people, that door would get fixed. But if you go around saying, well, that's not my job and I'm not going to report this. Well, you can't assume that somebody knows that there's a problem. It's the same with the pest problem. Clutter. Clutter, I know, is tantamount in most schools, but organized clutter. Keeping, you know, paper in, in rubber, rubberized containers. Keeping food in stored containers. Not leaving things left out so that pests can have a place to roam and thrive. It really does matter. If you've got if you're following breakfast in the classroom, you know, reporting a food or a drink spillage when they occur so that custodial knows that they need to fix that at a later time. That will also help to keep preventing pests from coming in. So inspections. Well, inspections for IPM are multi-level. A simple inspection revolves 
that the pest control contractor or who's ever doing pesticide applications on a monthly basis comes in, they may review the kitchen, they may go to the teacher's lounge, they may use some sticky cards to help identify problems. That's the first step. The second step is there is a problem in the building, for instance, it's ants, it's rats, it's mice, it's bats. This re revolves around doing an intense inspection, which means looking for pest vulnerable areas, ways they're getting in, places that they can harbor. This may not be done every time there's a pest problem, but at least maybe once a year or once every other year. And then maybe a new issue. Maybe there's lots of complaints coming from one wing in a building, and this would require the, the tactics of simple and intense so that, again, if you're having a public health problem, you resolve those issues so that you don't end up on the news. So what is an IPM inspection? It goes beyond sanitation. Again, we talked about pests needing three things to survive, food, water, harborage. The fourth thing is temperature. Depending on the pest is depending on will they thrive in a warm, moist environment. This particular um, cockroach right here, this German cockroach, they actually thrive in warm, moist environments, which typically are in food service areas. Well, you know, if you can, you can't always eliminate that temperature in the food and the water, but you can eliminate harborage by sealing up areas. So reducing that requisite. Sanitation, and I cannot stress this enough, sanitation is the best control of pests. If it's a clean environment, it will be a less pesty environment. And I really truly mean that because a lot of times pests don't need a whole lot. One crumb, one drop of water can survive a whole family of cockroaches and ants for a very long time. So the IPM process. This is the pest proofing pyramid. We start at the bottom and we work our way up. And we're going to go through some of these steps. So level one, proofing and sanitation. Again, like I said, I cannot stress this enough. It's the best way to clean up an area is to make it unhabitable for pests. As you can see in these images, you've got a lot of clutter in here. Okay, cleaning up after meals, snacks, and drinks. We're not saying you, don't, you can't have this jar of candy, but notice it's in a jar and it's got a, a lid on it. It's not loosely put on in a basket or something. You can have these things, but again, we've got to remember that we don't want to make it habitable for pests to come, and they can smell things much better than we can. So you want to keep things cleaned up. You want to do a regular clean out of lockers. You'd be surprised what students will store in their backpacks and in lockers. Pest proofing and sanitation. The most important component of a pest management program is pest proofing. If you've got a contractor that every time they do a job and they leave you a hole like this, well, you can just forget about mice and rats. You're going to be inviting raccoons, snakes, and other things. Remember this rule of thumb. A mouse only needs the size of your index finger or a dime to get in. A rat uses two fingers. If they can get their head in, their entire body is in. And once they are in your building, they are in your building. They're not going to leave. So let's look at some good images of this. So you have exterior doors. That's your first way of getting for people not to come into your building. Okay, we realize that's great for two-legged people, but if you notice where the pink arrows are pointing on this slide, you can see daylight. If you were to take a screwdriver, you could get a screwdriver underneath that. That means a mouse can get in. That means a cricket could get in, a cockroach, an ant, or depending on some other slithery things like snakes, they too could come in. So this is an area you'd want to look at as your first line of defense for pest proofing. Clutter. Clutter comes in various degrees and in various locations. This first room is a custodial closet. Well, they tend to be the dumping ground for everything. You don't want a lot of cardboard in there. You don't want a lot of trash in there. You want to keep this area neat and clean because you do have a sink or a well area that's going to have moisture. You want to make sure that that's not a good harborage place for cockroaches. This is at the back of a kitchen area. Well, yeah, you're going to have all these cartons for bread and for milk, 
but you sure don't need this plywood, you don't need these racks, you don't need this, could, this bucket that could also harbor water that could also breed mosquitoes. And then this is in a um, classroom, but all this storage in here, it makes it very hard that if you get an ant problem or a mouse problem, no one can inspect back in that area. So you really have got to look at stuff like that. All right, level two, education and awareness. Like I said, everyone in the school IPM program is responsible for their own environment. That includes teachers, that includes custodians, that includes secretaries, everybody. So if you see mouse droppings on your floor after you've come in off the weekend, who do you report that to? Make sure that you have a go-to person on your campus. If so, you know, make sure that that is reported. Make sure that somebody comes out and follows up on it. Then also make sure that you don't have a candy bar hanging out in your desk that you forgot about or what's in your purse. You know, these are things that we've got to look at and we do understand that sometimes pests will come in with kids. Again, on the educational awareness, reporting pests to your IPM coordinator. If you don't have a pest IPM coordinator in your district, you can find your facilities director. There's generally a good point person. After today, you'll be charged with going and finding that point person and seeing and introducing yourself to them and find out what is the procedure at your school district. Because the sooner you can report a pest problem, the sooner they can fix the pest problem. Nothing reported gets nothing done. Physical controls. Well, windows, doors, and plumbing penetrations. How many times have you propped a door open because you wanted the fresh air to come in? Well, you might not realize by doing that you're also allowing mosquitoes to come in, moths to come in, crawling in pests to come in. So when you do that or you open a window that's got a ripped screen, you're inviting the pests to come on in. Plumbing penetrations from the outdoors or inside. If you know that you've got an excursion plate that's broken, report it. Again, we want to be able to keep the pests from coming in to your classroom, into your work environment, so that you can get on with the business of doing what you do, which is teaching. In the kitchens and food service areas, drains are the number one pest problem. So which drain do you like better? Drain one with all the ilky guck? Or drain two is not a brand new kitchen. This is just a kitchen manager who is very type A about how clean her drains are going to be. But this gooky matter can lead to moth flies, drain flies, uh, fruit flies, cockroaches, and a variety of other pests living and thriving. So if this is in your area, there's some simple steps that can be done to actually clean the area. So you can either build them out, clean them out, or do something to get rid of them. All right, mechanical control. Use your IPM coordinator to utilize sticky traps and vacuum cleaners. Basically what they do is they will use these monitoring devices to actually look for pests. Those are 24-7. So if you don't like those, you know, you can have a discussion with your IPM coordinator, but I must tell you guys, this is the 21st century way of doing pest control. It's not with a spray can. It's not with putting down chemical along a baseboard. It is putting this out so that we know what pests are in your building so that we can target the right type of pesticide for that pest. Mm -hmm. These good old fashioned snap traps, all right? These are the greatest things because again, they get what they hit. The problem is a lot of people don't like seeing these dead little critters. But again, if you've got a good program going, they're gonna come in during the morning hours and they're going to deal with this. They'll come in, they'll pick up the dead animal, they'll dispose of it in a proper way and then they can move on. But these are still, I mean, while these snap traps are over 100 years old, they're still effective and they still do the right job. Okay, so monitoring and sampling. Like I said, I want to go over this point specifically. These sticky cards, they are used by pest management professionals to do the job correctly. When we use these, and as you can see this one image, there is one, two, three three cockroaches that you can see on this board. This is in a kitchen. 
those three cockroaches tell me as a pest management person that I've got a problem going on in this kitchen and it's not located in one spot. So when I make my treatments, I'm going to be looking for harborage areas where these cockroaches are going to be living. This one over here, this cockroach was on one end of a, a sticky trap and it's a different type of cockroach. That tells me I will be doing a different type of treatment. This is information. This is this is the technological advancement of the 21st century for pest control. This is like a Twitter account because I am seeing information in the 21st century on this glue board. So reporting. Well, how do you report a pest problem? Most campuses, they either have a pest siding log or a work order system. Again, with so many districts in this country, it's hard to determine who has got what. But I can tell you again, either check with your facilities director, your school principal, or someone on your district will know how they want you to report it. Typically with your work order system, it's generally a building manager or a campus secretary who will actually input the work orders. But they contact the coordinator. They will tell them who has got the pest problem. These pest problems can then be conveyed to the pest control company. So what do I want? Well, what I really don't want ever to see is what this guy is doing over here on the left, coming in and routinely spraying. That's not effective. That is so last year, as the, as the kids say. That is not what we're doing now. What we do now is when we have a pest problem, especially if we have that cockroach problem I was talking about, we may use baits and gels to target harborage areas where the adult cockroach will come and feed and they will take the bait back to the harborage and feed it to their young, killing both adults and youth. And I don't mean that in the wrong way. But again, you should also be using licensed pesticide applicators and you would probably need to check with your Department of Agriculture in your state to determine what is the proper methods for doing pest control in your state. So a couple of things about pesticides, just so you guys know. I'm not anti-pesticide because I think they're very, very useful in what we do. However, I think the overuse of pesticides can impact not only our kids, but our adults and our environment. You as a teacher or a school employee should never ever bring a can of Raid or any other type of pesticide or home remedy to school. If you've got a problem, like I said, report it to the coordinator. In some states, depending on their school IPM rules, they can only use certain chemicals as a first step. Speaking of Texas, we use what we call green chemicals first. That's our first line of defense. It's baits, it's gels, it's um, low impact, low toxicity products. Teamwork makes the best IPM program. IPM takes people management. People have got to communicate. And when I mean communication, I really do mean verbal communication through one-to-one -one conversations. Email works great, Twitter works great, you know, text messages, but nothing says what you really mean until you sit down and you talk to somebody face-to-face -face because they can see your stress level, they can read your body language. So if you really have got some issues with um, cockroaches in a classroom, you know, the coordinator wants to know that, but they also want to know how, how you're going to react to certain things and you've also got to remember some things will take time and like I said education is an overlooked tactic overlooked tactic so who would need to be educated in a school system the staff the teachers and the administrators but I've got two other people listed or two other groups listed on this slide parents and students well it would all depend right now there's a huge initiative nationwide to have these farm to school programs on each campus, which means having a school or a community garden on a, a school campus. Well, if you've got parents, volunteers, and students in those gardens, they may also need to be aware of what is IPM. What you really don't want is you want some good intentioned parent or volunteer to come onto your campus, make an application, and then you all be in violation of some state or federal laws about what product they used. In the South, it's extremely important because there's only a few products labeled for 
vegetables on fire ants. So you want to make sure that, again, you know the rules and that your group that you're dealing with also knows these rules. So how do you maintain your IPM program? In Texas, again, my home state, we make it mandatory that every school adopt an IPM policy statement. But in some states, um, it's a voluntary or it's not even a requirement. The first thing to a successful IPM program is having that IPM policy statement adopted by your school board. Have a committee, get a school nurse, get a school board member, get your risk coordinator, get, get those people who are in and out of the buildings, the head custodian, food service, get those people in talking amongst themselves. Find out who's responsible for what. Again, open those lines of communication. Who is licensed to make applications? You don't want everybody to be able to do this. Set out roles, responsibilities, and then review your bid specifications. I'm always shocked and amazed that we're still using bid specifications that read like they're from the 1970s. We have lots of forms and lots of ways to help. I sit on a national steering committee. We are here to help you as far as getting information and we'll be glad to help you get more information. Professional IPM services. Well, as that image shows you to the right, there is a gentleman and he's got a wand in his hand and he's spraying the baseboards. I have never understood why baseboards needed to be sprayed. There's, they've done nothing to any of us. But what could be going on in there instead is the use of sticky cards, a thorough and regular inspection of these pest vulnerable areas, looking into those cabinets, um, and then talking to the staff and people within a building about what they've seen. Where are the problems? Um, does the applicator recommend housekeeping tips? Um, are the pesticide applications made on a routine basis? Do you look at service tickets? If you're the facility director, are you looking at service tickets and seeing that they're making an application once a month? If they are, it's time to have a conversation. Are you provided with the pesticide labels and the MSD sheets? And when, you're, when they do an application, do they give you a detailed record? When did they put it out? What did they put out? Why did they put it out? How much did they put it out? It's the grammar lesson of, of when we were kids. Who, what, when, where, why? So some tips to remember. Get to know your IPM coordinator. If you see something, say something. Again, you see that raccoon coming up out of a trash can? Say something to somebody so that something can be done about getting the trash emptied during the, in the evening hours, that no student's going to be harmed. If you can see up in the upper left-hand area, there's a bat. That bat is inside a building. But again, that means that there's a ceiling tile that's open and cracked. Remember, sanitation, not pesticides, will do more to prevent pests than any other practice and that you tell your coordinator what you're seeing. Never try to solve the pest problem yourself. The district has a responsibility for everyone, and they, do, they are concerned about pest problems. Typically what happens is it's not getting to the right person. If you don't feel your, your, answer, your questions are being answered, keep going until you get the answer. Please don't make the news your first place you go. And again, remember, it's ultimately the district's responsibility for you to have an effective IPM program and preventing pests from entering your school. That concludes the educational portion of our lesson today. Um, please use the text box for questions, and as I receive them, I will answer them. The table shown earlier indicate many states are implementing different IPM initiatives. However, is there any recent national initiative to regulate these actions for similar IPM across the nation? To answer your question, no. And this has to go back to, if you really want to get down to it, the United States as, as a whole. States prefer individual rights over federal rights. And while the SEPA legislation has been enacted many times, Instead, what we have seen, and I will be very honest with you, over the last 12 to 14 years, we went from having 15 states with school IPM rules to 39 states simply because they don't want a federal rule. Okay, next question. What is the best way to control for wasps that like to build nests on eaves? That's a kind of a hard question, but part of it has to do with 
power washing and training people as to what to look for. A lot of times what happens is they are fast nest builders. You can leave on a Friday and by Monday they could have built a small nest. What happens is, is no one reports that nest and then what, when you generally hear about it, it's a, be sure to talk to your staff about when to report, what to do. Um, we do have some fact sheets and if you can log on to the, either the Facebook or Twitter page, I'll be glad to send out those um, links later today. All right, we're going to continue our discussion on Facebook and Twitter. I thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed this session and please let us know if there's anything else we can do for you. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Ms. Janet Hurley, and our participants for joining our webinar today. We hope that you took this opportunity to learn from the content presented, engaged with the speaker, and will use this content to advance your professional knowledge on issues related to effective and efficient school facilities maintenance. Please join us again soon for upcoming ASEF events. Remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Following today's webinar, ASEF would encourage all participants to engage with today's presenter through social media. Our presenter will be available briefly following the webinar to answer any questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.